Hello everyone, this is Ali with Globalistas Art. Today we're going to talk about European and American art from 1715 to 1840 and look at the works by John Singleton Copley. The key works that we're going to look at are Copley's Thomas Mifflin and Sarah Morris, otherwise known as Mr. and Mrs. Mifflin, and Copley's Watson and the Shark. Our key terms are the Academy, which is an institution established for the training of artists. Academies date from the Renaissance and after. They are particularly powerful in state-run institutions in the 17th and 18th centuries. In general, academies replaced guilds as the venues where students learned the craft of art and were educated in art theory. Academies helped the recognition of artists as trained specialists rather than craftspeople and promoted their social status. An academician was an academy trained artist. So essentially in the 17th century, you had what was known as um, the establishment of the academies. And what this did was actually, um, so in, in France you had Louis XIV, the Sun King, uh, who didn't really like that the, the culture of um, his people were essentially run by the guilds. And so what he did was he consolidated um, many of the guilds into what are known as the Beaux-Arts, which um, are typically sculpture, painting, and architecture. And he put these, um, these arts under the state rather than the guilds. And then in the 18th century, you had the establishment of the Royal Academy of Art in England. And this one was run by, the first one um, was basically run by uh, Charles Le, Le Brun in France. And he painted um, art that celebrated the king because at the time um, the king was an absolute monarch. And then in the 18th century, you had the English um, established the Royal Academy of Art, and this was run by Joshua Reynolds. And within the academy, you have now almost a little caste system for genres. So um, genres are basically just the type of painting. So the status of painting genres according to the academy um, these were codified in the 17th century, and the most important types of paintings were history paintings. These are based on historical, mythological, or biblical narratives. They usually convey a high moral or intellectual idea. History paintings are typically very large, and when they are shown at the annual exhibition, history paintings are also usually placed at the very top of the gallery hang, and in these academic exhibitions, you have a floor to ceiling hang where every little part of the wall is covered. And at the very top, you'd see these kind of massive history paintings. Then the next on the list are portraiture, and these are just paintings of person. What Joshua Reynolds did in England, because there weren't a lot of um, commissions for history paintings, which was he combined the portraiture and history painting to create basically history portraits. And history portraits are uh, when you place the sitter or the subject within the context of the um, of a situation. So for instance, you might have a painting of a general who is placed within a battle scene. Then genre paintings, and genre paintings are scenes of everyday life of ordinary people in work or recreation. Landscape paintings, depictions of natural scenery and art. Landscape paintings may capture mountains, valleys, bodies of water, fields, forests, and coasts, and may or may not include man-made structures as well as people. And then finally, still lifes, which are uh, depictions of inanimate objects such as flowers or fruits. So when we're looking at the work of John Singleton Copley, we're going to, um, it's basically, uh, we're in America, even though um, his life actually ends in England. And he is a really important painter during the American Revolution. 
So important events in the American Revolution are uh, the Proclamation of 1763. And this was um, basically at the ending of the French and Indian War, you had um, the English crown basically saying people, colonists couldn't settle past the Appalachian Mountains and uh, the colonists were taxed because of this. And then you had the Sugar Act, which placed a tax on molasses. Um, and then the Stamp Act, which placed a tax on essentially stamping, um, stamping legal documents. Then uh, the Stamp Act is repealed because this um, causes an uproar, um, most notably with Samuel Adams, who um, essentially makes the the phrase taxation without representation is tyranny very popular and starts rallying people against um, British rule. Then you have the Townsend Acts, uh, the Boston Massacre, the Tea Act, and then the Boston Tea Party, the Coercive Acts, the Intolerable Acts, Battles of Lexington and Concord, Washington keeps command of the army. We have the Declaration of Independence, which is written. Americans win the Battle of Saratoga. France comes in and gives America supplies and men. The war then shifts to the southern colonies, and um, the colonists actually partake in guerrilla warfare to, um, to defeat the British. And then finally, uh, the American colonists win, um, and you have... Uh, Cornwallis surrendering in Yorktown, Virginia. And in 1783, Americans and British signed the Treaty of Paris, ending the war. And a fabulous um, part of culture that depicts one of our founding fathers, Alexander Hamilton, is the Hamilton uh, musical, which actually has... Um, a lot of historical information about the American Revolution, and then the formation of the American government. And then in 1775 uh, to 1783, we we're looking at art in the American Revolution. And so the American Revolution was a series of dramatic events that had many heroic people that needed to be memorialized in images. The new nation needed a history and this history needed to be represented visually. And then we had portraits and history paintings that were needed um, to basically memorialize these figures. The U.S. also needed new educational institutions to educate citizens about the values of the new nations. And then academies of art established not only to train artists, but to invest in the profession and create a sense of tradition. So you had politicians and businessmen who wanted to show the newness of the nation, but also wanted the new nation to have historical legitimacy. So therefore there was inclusion of many classical forms such as these neoclassical buildings where you had temple fronts on um, buildings, temple fronts that looked basically like the Parthenon. Then many thought that American taste was not on the same level as Europe. And this actually would continue essentially until the um, until World War II, where you had this kind of mass uh, influx of European artists uh, coming into America. And a great resource to look at um, the American Revolution is a Crash Course, which uh, I really like looking at these videos for just kind of um, these historical moments in a uh, nutshell. And now let's look at uh, John Singleton Copley. So John Singleton Copley lived from 1738 to 1815. He's most associated with Boston and Boston um, has an area 
essentially in the middle of Boston proper called Copley Square, named after the artist. He's a New England painter. He's known for his portraits in the American Revolution. But keep in mind that he painted both loyalists and patriots because he didn't know who was going to win the war. And he had to make sure that he would have a career after the war. He was born in 1738. His mother owned a tobacco shop and his father was ill and went to the West Indies and actually died when Copley was just a baby. His mother then remarried um, to Peter Pelham and Pelham was um, actually was able to teach Copley a mezzotint. And so mezzotint is basically just this intaglio process where you kind of scratch uh, with a metal, almost like a pencil, into a metal plate, a drawing. So you're basically drawing on a metal plate and then you can print that plate. But Pelham died when Copley was 13. So then Copley starts training himself to become the best artist he can be so that he can get commissions. And so from this time forward, he's essentially self-trained. And he becomes one of the most sought after portrait portraitists in the colonies, and he lives in Boston. He's known for his ability to render texture, display the subject's personality, and include symbols of the per person's status in his portraits. In 1774, he goes to England to go on his grand tour, and the grand tour was popular during the 18th and 19th centuries. It was an extended tour of cultural sites in France and Italy, intended to finish the education of a young upper-class person, primarily for Britain or America. So this is essentially kind of like taking a semester abroad, except you would go with an entourage, essentially. And you would start, um, if you were in the American colonies, you would then go to London. If you were English, you would start in London and then go to Paris, the south of France, um, Venice, Florence, Naples, and end in Rome. And he is known for a portraiture, which is a painting of a person. So now let's look at um, his largest work, which he painted in England, which is his family. And here we're able to see his ability to render textures and show the personality of each of his sitters. He was able to look at works by Raphael and other artists from Italy. And here we can see similarities with uh, atmospheric perspective in Raphael's Madonna of the Goldfinch, which is similar in Copley's Portrait of His Family. And then also in this rendering of um, Madonna with uh, John the Baptist and Christ Child, you have this pyramidal composition which he recreates in the image of his wife with two of his children. So here we see that he has four children, but actually one of his um, children uh, died during childhood. And this was very common at the time um, for a variety of reasons, including um, that they didn't have modern medicine uh, in this period. And over here is Copley's stepfather. And here is the artist who's looking out at us. And we can see his ability to uh, emulate textures in paint with the fabrics and then the backgrounds. And we have um, other fabrics within the drapery of his wife's dress and the chair as well as the rug. And this would have been his largest work. But if we kind of rewind and look at his earlier works, this is a painting called Henry Pelham, which was his half-brother, and it's sometimes known as Boy with a Squirrel. He actually painted this in 1765, and he sent it to England almost as a sampler to show people in England what he could do so that he might obtain an offer to then go to England to uh, paint there or to receive more commissions. And this is just a masterwork when it comes to textures. Look at Henry Pelham's hair. It's almost as though you can touch it. And then we have other textures with the gold chain, the little squirrel, the squirrel's bushy tail, the wood of the table, the glass, the water in the glass, and then the fabrics with the drapery and Henry Pelham's outfit, as well as his skin tones. And this is a bit interesting because here we almost have a pyramidal composition 
which would emulate the uh, Italian Renaissance, but then he's actually looking out in this open form that's more reminiscent of uh, Baroque work where we can tell that the scene extends beyond the, the canvas. So some scholars have thought that this could be shown as a balance uh, or a need for a balance between man and nature as um, Henry is uh, carefully balancing this gold chain as well as the squirrel is doing the same thing. And then it might also re reflect the balance of the colonies. And then here we see this same kind of halfway mark in the, the glass. And when this was sent to England, uh, Joshua Reynolds, who was the head of the Royal Academy, um, complimented Copley's work and thought that he had talents, but he almost gave it kind of like a backhanded compliment where it was like, it was a good painting for an American. Another one of Copley's signature works that um, show one of the things that Copley is most known for, which is including symbols of the sitter's career and status and a lot of times political leanings within his paintings is the portrait of Paul Revere. So Paul Revere was one of the Sons of Liberties. He was a master silversmith and here he has his um, silver teapot but when you were um, a metal worker, you were also trained in engraving, and therefore he was able to create um, etchings. And one of his most famous etchings is uh, the etching of the, which then became a prince of the Boston Massacre, which was actually created after Henry Pelham's work of the same subject. And then he also engraved uh, what is known as the Liberty Bowl with the names of the Sons of Liberty. And this is exhibited in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston in front of Paul Revere's portrait and with other portraits by Copley. However, this would have actually, and all of these portraits would have been hung in the private homes of the sitters. Here we see Revere is, has this kind of directness that's associated with um, Americans and his ability to work hard, kind of establish his craft. Paul Revere would have known pretty much everyone in Boston at the time. And this painting would have been in his house until the, um, and part of his family, until the Great Depression when um, many people had to part with their works because they needed, um, they needed money um, and it was, uh, sold to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Here is Paul Revere's house, which has been, been turned into a museum, which is in the north end of Boston, which I highly recommend if you visit Boston to go to both Paul Revere's house and um, the Museum of Fine Arts. When I taught this image in a class, I put up um, this portrait and I asked the students, uh, who is this? And everyone said at the same time, Jack Black. And I actually couldn't believe how much um, Jack Black looks like Paul Revere. And there are actually quite a few memes out there about uh, the similarities between um, Paul Revere's aesthetic and Jack Black's. And now let's look at one of our key works. So this is a double portrait of Thomas Mifflin and his wife, Sarah Morris. So Copley is known for textures, but also incorporating aspects into the painting that tell about the sitter. So here we see that um, these are a relatively well-to-do couple, and we can tell this because of the fabrics of um, Sarah Morris's um, dress and also the fabrics and the suiting of her husband, Thomas Mifflin. Mifflin was a prominent merchant and politician, and they were both on the sides of um, the Patriots. And we can tell this because Sarah is actually not wearing um, kind of these dramatic adornments with, um, even though her, her fabrics are fine, they're not kind of overly embellished and she doesn't have lots of jewelry. Instead, she just has a simple choker on. And she is here um, attending to a domestic task, which shows where uh, she would have worked within the realm of society at the time. 
And then Tom Smithlin actually stops reading, which shows that he is an intellectual, to gaze at his wife lovingly, which implies that they had a very nice relationship and that they were both hardworking, just in the different um, positions that were allowed to them at the time. And what's also interesting is that Sarah, rather than Thomas, is the center of this portrait, which might also show her kind of um, center status as um, of her household. And the same year, the colonists protested uh, the British tax on tea and the British staged the Boston Tea Party where they seized British tea and tossed it into the harbor. And so this portrait, even though it was um, commissioned in Boston when the couple most likely was visiting Boston for a funeral, it would have been hung in the couple's house in Philadelphia. And here we have an example of a history painting. And a history painting is a painting based on historical, mythological, or biblical narratives, and it usually conveys a high moral or intellectual idea. This is our second key work, and it is Watson and the Shark. Copley actually painted three versions of this um, painting. He, the first one was, um, he gave um, to Brooke Watson, which, who commissioned this portrait. Brooke Watson was a London merchant, and remember, Copley visited England in 1774, where he would live until his death. Brooke Watson was an English politician who actually became the mayor of London. However, in 1749, um, he was uh, working on a boat in um, Havana, Cuba, and he actually fell into the water and was attacked by a shark. And the shark bit him and actually bit off um, the lower portion of his leg and foot down here. And he survived after three attempts of people trying to save him. And Watson hired Copley to paint the event to show his ability to overcome struggles and also overcome pretty much different, um, the elements and then different kind of problems that uh, life and the world are going to um, give each person during their life. So, However, Copley was um, very adept at painting people, and here we can see the different expressions of each of the people's faces. This person was actually initially a younger person, and then he um, redid uh, this person to make him an older sailor. And then he didn't, he had never visited um, Cuba, and the water almost looks like water that you might see in Boston, although it's a little bit. Um, more turquoisey to make it appear like the Caribbean. And he looked at paintings and prints of the uh, Havana Harbor to paint the harbor, and he actually did a pretty good job with that. However, he didn't know about shark's anatomy. And so here we see this kind of almost like fanciful rendering of a shark, which kind of reminds me of Durer's Rhinoceros, where uh, the artist just didn't know the exact anatomy of the animal. And the shark actually has these flaring nostrils, which is kind of comical as he's going to bite Watson. And keep in mind that um, here we have um, that uh, Copley, you know, went on his grand tour, was able to look at Italian artists, and we have almost this classical rendering of um, Watson which almost looks like a work of uh, Michelangelo. And again, we have our pyramidal composition in the forefront. And, but then also this painting was commissioned by an Englishman who would have um, been on the English side of the American Revolution. And he, um, like many English uh, people at the time, thought that a lot of what the revolution stood for was hypocritical because the American colonists wanted freedom from the British crown, yet still partook in the slave trade and slavery. And so here we have the inclusion of this figure, which um, might point to the hypocrisy of the American revolution and um, the, uh, the commissioners' uh, political leanings and thoughts on the subject. 
So we have three versions and the second version is at the MFA Boston and it's actually the same size as this painting and Copley actually painted it for himself and then he created a third smaller version which is at the Detroit Institute of Arts. All right, thank you so much and I hope you enjoyed this talk.